Hi, my name is Paul Beckman. I'm the CTO of DSP Concepts. My talk today is entitled Ethos U55 Performance Optimization for Edge-Based Processing of Real-World Audio and Machine Learning Applications. Essentially, we're going to take the latest U55 processor, put it through its paces, and see how it performs on real-world audio ML-based inference. My talk is organized as following. First, we're going to see how machine learning is changing audio processing. Then we're going to talk about moving machine learning to the edge with TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. And there's a real change in mindset. Machine learning, many people are comfortable using it on the cloud, but how do you have to think about it when you're doing things on the edge? Then we're going to provide actual benchmarking results comparing the M7 versus the U55 processor. We're going to look at two models. First, a large YAMnet sound classification model over 4 million weights, and then a small vocabulary model called Hello Edge with about 50,000 weights. We're going to compare them, and we're going to see the U55 is significantly faster. Finally, then we're going to wrap up and make conclusions. So what's happening with audio processing? Well, everybody knows about the voice assistants, Alexa and Google, but machine learning is fundamentally changing every aspect of audio processing. Kind of hard to imagine, but let's just consider earbuds. What's happening? Well, you're getting voice recognition in your earbuds. How about machine learning based noise reduction? Ability to sense what's happening in your ambient environment. Am I in a car? Am I out on the street? Am I in a noisy coffee shop? And then have it adjust the processing. How about some sort of audio classification? Maybe there's a siren sound that's important it should let in or there's other noise that's not important that it should block out. We're using machine learning for tuning of active noise cancellation systems. And finally, there's many applications for activity and health monitoring that are all based on ML. Traditional signal processing started in the 1950s. It's very mathematical. Often you optimize, so you come up with a cost function, you optimize the processing. And the underlying building blocks are FFTs, different types of filters, beamformers, and so forth. Machine learning, though it's been around, but really been major advances in the last 10 years. It's also highly mathematical, but instead of a cost function, it's based on training data. So you give it training data, and then it learns the mapping. And in some sense, we're mim mimicking nature with machine learning. That's how people learn, that's how animals learn, and so forth. And instead of solely using machine learning, the best practices nowadays are to combine traditional audio processing and machine learning. That's where you get the best applications. The way machine learning works is there's two phases. You start out with training data. So you train the system, you have training data, you go through feature extraction. In the audio case, this would simulate what's happening in your ear. Maybe you're splitting the audio into separate frequency bands. Then the, the features are passed to the neural network, and then from there you generate the model. This training usually happens in the cloud. Lots of processing involved. Next phase is inference. That happens on the device. Instead of having training data, you're now taking data from an actual sensor. That might be, for example, a microphone. You go through the same feature extraction block. You go through the model and that'll give you a result there at the end. So training usually happens in the cloud and inference, inference is on the device. Now, why would you wanna move stuff to the edge? Why can't we just keep things in the cloud? Well, there's lots of applications that you can do on the edge. On the edge, you can reduce your bandwidth. You're not always sending things to the cloud. There's less work for the cloud to do. You can also reduce power consumption by doing things locally. You can get lower latency. It's kind of annoying if you always have to wait for the cloud to make the decision. Net delay could be few, a few seconds. You could also have higher reliability. What if your network connection is down? Do you want everything going down? Maybe you can't unlock your home because your front door doesn't recognize you without a network connection. And then there's also privacy concerns. Now let's look at TensorFlow. There's actually several variants of TensorFlow. On the left side is the full TensorFlow that runs on the cloud, usually takes gigabytes of data. 
In the middle, they've done a TensorFlow Lite. This is typically targeted for cell phone applications. You're running on an application processor like a high-end ARM Cortex-A. Typically, you, you might have megabytes of data. And finally, now with TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, you want to get into very low power, low cost products. There you're running on MCUs and DSPs. And instead of megabytes, now you're down to kilobytes. Still further advancements are needed here. Uh, it would be good people should continue to work on model size reduction. Memory really translates directly to the cost of the product. So if we can reduce the memory, that helps. Along with that, quantize data types. Instead of floating point, 16-bit, 8-bit, 4-bit data types. We also need advances in power reduction, so specialized processors like NPUs. That's what the U55 is. We'd like to see people create development cockpits, so maybe there's a single cockpit where you can do your training, your testing, and so forth. We also need efficient debug environments. We're going to talk about that a little more later. Okay. Improvements in network architecture searches. How do we determine what's the best overall architecture to do? And also, we need to figure out how to do the right performance size and power trade-offs. Let's compare cloud thinking with edge mindset. When you're working in the cloud, you usually have a full operating system. Typically, that's Linux. On the edge, you're running an RTOS or even bare metal. On the cloud, you have access to any language, inc including scripts like Python. On the edge, you're usually constrained to C or C++. Cloud is usually a non-real-time system. It, the task gets done when it gets done. On the edge, there's real-time constraints. You have to process the data in real time, or you're not going to complete the task. On the cloud, you have high-end multi-core CPUs, GPUs, and so forth. If it's too slow, you can throw more resources at it. Just rent a bigger uh, uh, GPU on AWS. On the edge device, you have embedded processors, constrained resources. You're cost sensitive. You have to get by with low power. And one of the things people don't fully appreciate the cloud is much easier to debug. You have logging capabilities. You have a console where you can echo information and really good debug features. On the edge, you're limited to your debug features. You typically don't have a console. Uh, you have to make special, uh, uh, take special steps in order to log data and so forth. So it's quite different when you're running on the edge. And I talked about the earbud example. We desperately need more processing for earbuds. Typical products right now, you might have a 200 megahertz fixed point DSP. And if you've ever had to take a phone call from a noisy room uh, and no one can understand you, so you're often forced to constantly mute and unmute your phone. And the reason is you can't fit the, uh, the latest machine learning uh, algorithms on the earbuds. 200 megahertz fixed point DSP, just isn't going to cut it. What do we need? We need to use the next generation Cortex M55 and U55 processors. Okay, The M55 should give us about a 4x speed up of traditional audio processing through the Helium instructions. And then the U55, we're going to see, it gives us 40 to 100 times speed up of ML inference. And if we had these next generation processors, instead of constantly having to mute and unmute, your calls are going to be crystal clear using ML-based separation and sound enhancement. And now you can focus on the call rather than on muting and unmuting. Let's look at the application now. Uh, first one we profiled is what's called YAMnet, and this is audio event classification. So YAMnet is a pre-trained uh, neural network. Uh, it's a deep neural network that can predict audio events. It's trained for 521 classes. So things like laughter, coughing, siren, animals, and so forth. That's all uh, 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 in there already. It's a large model. It has 4 million weights. And as we saw, it uses a combination of traditional signal processing for feature extraction. And then uh, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers is used for the inference. So this YAMnet is available publicly. You can get it from the URL below. And we did the measurements using the AudioWeaver platform. 
So these are proprietary tools from DSP Concepts. It contains a combination of graphical design tools, so you can design your signal flow. You're going to see this in action, and you can see how we can include TensorFlow. We have optimized runtime libraries. They're optimized for all the ARM architectures and allows you to quickly design, debug, and deploy your processing. We also have an ML audio checklist that we uh, provide. And these applications are tricky because if it's not working well, you have to be able to debug the system. So we create a, provide a step-by-step -step audio product checklist. You have to make sure your microphones have the right noise floor. You're not clipping or reaching the acoustic overload point. They're free of harmonics. High frequency rejection, your, your PDM filters are working. Your microphones have to be properly ported and isolated, free from conducted sound. If you're doing beamforming, your microphones have to be matched in gain, and they all have to be time synchronized. Loudspeakers have their own problems, and even system level issues with microphones. You have to check, it your, check your clock stability, make sure there's fixed latency. You have to make sure you're not overflowing the CPU, so you're dropping samples. You may have audio buffer overruns and underruns of dropping samples. All of these things can trip you up when you're doing ML on the edge. And the tools we have allow you to debug these things uh, very quickly. This is what feature extraction looks like in AudioWeaver. So you build it up using the AudioWeaver modules. These are kind of primitive signal processing elements. So here we're doing windowing, FFTs, complex magnitude, and then combining it, the data into separate bands. Okay. So this is a, a feature extraction AudioWeaver. You can also, if you're doing training in the cloud, you can also run the same AudioWeaver model via your Python scripts. We'll also drag and drop the uh, TensorFlow Lite for Micro module inside of AudioWeaver. You point it at the model file for YAMNet. This has about 4 million int 8 weights. It's a large model. And then you put the whole thing together. You have the data coming in left. On the left, you go through feature extraction and then into TensorFlow. And then there's additional modules there for post-processing, uh, visually displaying the information, and so forth. So we measured this on two different processors. First on the M7, so we use an STM H747 processor. This runs at 480 megahertz and has an integrated cycle counter for profiling. That's how we did the measurements. And on the Ethos U55, we verified it in two ways. First, we looked at the output of the Vela compiler that gives estimates for cycle counts. And we also measured on the ARM CoreStone 300 fixed virtual platform and you'll see that the results lined up very well. We configured the U55 uh, for 256 MAC units and uh, 50 kilobytes internal SRAM. And the processor is configured as could run at up to one gigahertz. So this is the first results when we were running on the M7. And we were running one inference per second. And so what you'll see is it takes about 140 million clock cycles total ticks. Okay, that corresponds to 146 megahertz running in real time. And so instead of doing one inference every second, suppose I wanted to do it every 10 milliseconds. So I'm, I got data coming in at blocks of 10 milliseconds. Well, instead of 140 megahertz, now we're going to be at 14 gigahertz. Okay, so there's no way this is going to fit on an M7, such a large model. Let's look at the Vela compiler output now. So what it'll do is it basically tells you memory sizes needed here. Okay, this one, uh, assume we're running at 500 megahertz. And what we saw is that each inference takes about 3.4 million cycles. That's what the Vela compiler did. And when we measured it this different way, it came up with 3.2 million cycles. So it's quite close. So uh, with this system, this means that it would take 6.81 milliseconds, and we could do 146 inferences per second. So this one's going to be able to run in real time at the 10 millisecond block rate, and then this will fit all on the U55. This assumed 256 max, 
and we can also reduce the size of the, the U55. And if we scale down to 32 max, you'll see we'll go from 146 to 102 inferences per second. And if we compare everything here, you'll see a substantial improvement. We're, th we're 30 to 43 times faster with the U55, and it can finally run in real time. I'll note in this case that we don't see such a big speed up going to 256 max. The reason is it's a large model. It turns out this is really memory limited. And so we don't get such a big improvement from the uh, uh, additional max. Let's look at a smaller model here called the Hello Edge. So this is speech commands. So instead of 521 classes, there's 12 classes. So simple, uh, short words get, get detected here. So again, similar type of feature extraction we did. We go into the TensorFlow model. In this case, there's 54,000 weights, so it's much smaller. Put the whole thing together. Looks very similar as before. And here's the results on the M7. Okay, in this case, it takes 6.56 million cycles to do one inference. This has a block size of 20 milliseconds. So to run in real time, we would have to do 50 in inferences. So that'd be 328 megahertz. So this would actually fit running in real time on the M7. Let's look at the Vela compiler output. Okay, so you can see the memory sizes. This uses much less RAM, much less memory bandwidth. Okay. In this case, total cycles, about 58,000 cycles. And at that speed, we could do over 8,000 inferences per second. So this is happening much, much faster. And you'll see that now the IO and computation is happening in parallel. So model is balanced and we're no longer memory bound. When we go to the 32 Mac unit, you see we drop from over 8,000 inferences to about 1,900. So in this case, we are really processing bound. Okay. It drops by about a factor of four. Still, this is gonna easily run in real time. Let's put everything together now. What we see now is uh, the U55 is anywhere between 46 and 117 times faster. The M7, although it runs in real time, uh, it takes up most of the processor. So it'd be nice to have a, an ML coprocessor for this. So we can see significant speed ups here compared to the M7. So just to wrap up, audio is going through a revolution based on machine learning. Okay. Can't emphasize that more being an audio engineer. Applications combine traditional signal processing plus machine learning. So you can't give up your traditional signal processing. You have to augment it with machine learning. Many applications requiring processing on the edge. I've been using the earbud as an example, but there's many, many other applications. Imagine home monitoring or monitoring what's happening in your car. All of these things should be on the edge. And finally, we also saw that the Ethos U55 provides substantial processing speed up. And we're excited to see the next generation products that this is going to enable. So thank you for your time and attention today.